Welcome to the San Francisco Bay Area Conversation presented by Californians for the Arts and California Arts Advocates. We're so glad that everybody can join us. Um, my name is Rachel Osajima, and I am the director of the Alameda County Arts Commission. This is actually the last of nine regional conversations that's presented <clears throat> by Californians for the Arts and California Arts Advocates. The conversations have taken place throughout the state and our, they're led by our wonderful executive director, Julie Baker, and supported by staff member, Jade Elisa. Um, so each conversation has had a planning committee comprised of local board members. And in this San Francisco Bay Area region, the board members are Brad Erickson, Heather Dunn, and myself. Um, this event will include a short presentation and then a group conversation. Um, so we really want to be able to have different ways for you to be involved and communicate with us. So first, we'd like to thank you for being here and we would love to see who is participating. So um, if you could go into your chat box and um, type in your name and a little bit about yourself, such as your organization or your role in the arts community, that would be great. We can start to see who's here. So while you're doing that, a little bit of some housekeeping information. Um, we will be recording this session and the recording will be available to the public in the future. We will be keeping a copy of the comments in the chat box to help make sure that we read all of the um, comments after the event. Keep track of your ideas. Later when we arrive at the conversation portion of our meeting, um, we ask that you use the raise hand function. So a reminder to raise your hand in Zoom click the participants button and then at the bottom of the screen, which is at the bottom of the screen and then click on raise your hand. And then one of the moderators will note that you raised your hand and will call on you when it's time to speak. Um, so the big idea for this event is to cultivate a stronger regional coalition and exchange ideas. We want to listen and learn from all of you so that we can be responsive to the community voices um, in any region specific issues. Um, we want to be able to stay in touch with you in the future. Um, Californians for the Arts is actually the only nonprofit organization that has the goal of providing a network of support to all areas of arts, culture, and creativity throughout the state. And its sister organization, California Arts Advocates, is the only advocacy organization serving all areas of arts, culture, and creativity. So um, in a minute, we are gonna start a short poll so that you can tell us more about, um, about who you are. Um, but first, before we even get started on the presentations or the conversations, um, we wanted to take a group photo of all of you on our Zoom call uh, because this is the last of the nine and we don't wanna wait till the end of the meeting to take the group photo, so we wanna take it now. So the photo might be used um, on our website or social media, so now, so if you want to be in the group photo, turn on your video camera. Um, if you do not want to be in the group photo, then turn off your video or, or step away. Um, and so there are a lot of us on, on, the on the call. So it's going to take us a little bit of time to take the screenshot. So I'm suggesting we all like look at the camera, smile, you can like wave or put, make a thumbs up. So um, Jade, Elisa, are you ready to take our screenshots? I'm assuming she is. Okay, so everybody, can you like wave or do a thumbs up and smile and just let's hold it for a little while. Do we still need to hold? We are all good now. Yay! Okay, great teamwork. All right, so with that, good accomplishment, we, I gotta scroll down here to my notes. Um, Let's start with, we thought we'd start the poll. And so you can answer that. There's just three questions. Um, so do you want to head and go ahead and put it on the screen, the poll? And so um, just three questions. First, we want to find out more about you. So you can select one or more of the options about who you are and what role you play. We know many of you do many different things in the arts community. Second, we want to learn about your thoughts about priority program areas that could be provided by Californians for the Arts and California Arts Advocates. 
And then third, we wanted to learn more about your interest in potential future conversations of this type. Okay, so. Oh, Jade is saying you need, she needs to launch, launch them separately. So I guess just keep on answering those as they, as they appear. Okay, so while you're um, both filling out a poll and listening, um, now I have the pleasure of introducing my co-host, Brad Erickson. Brad is the Executive Director of Theater Bay Area. He has also been a board member of Californians for the Arts and California Arts Advocates for 16 years, during which time he served as board president for six years. And I'm so glad I met Brad 13 years ago and then joined the board. And, and I just, Brad, I want to thank you for all of your dedicated leadership and all of your hard work. And I'm going to hand the uh, speaking over to you. Great. Thank you, Rachel. I'm Brad Erickson. Um, yes, a longtime board member with Californians for the Arts and California Arts Advocates. I'm the executive director of Theater Bay Area. I use he, him pronouns. Um, I'm, really, I'm really thrilled to have all of you, so many people on on this Zoom call today for this conversation, the first of its kind that we've done, at least as far as I can remember in the 16 years that I've been with Californians for the Arts around the state. And as Rachel pointed out, this is the ninth of the series. We always save the best for last. And so Bay Area is best and here we are. Um, and we, we are looking to um, engage you in a conversation. First, we do want to um, share some information with you from some folks who are working in various arenas around advocacy and support for the arts at different levels. Um, we have with us today Narek Rome from Americans for the Arts. I'll be introducing him formally a little bit later. Julie Baker, who is the Executive Director of Californians for the Arts and California Arts Advocates, who will be talking about many things that are happening at the statewide level. Also today, Jason Schmelzer, who is the lobbyist for California Arts Advocates, will be talking about what is happening in Sacramento in ways that we can be involved. And then um, uh, the last of our speakers today is Deborah Cullinan, who is the Chief Executive Officer at Yerba Buena Center for the Arts. Deborah is on the Governor's Task Force around um, the recovery efforts in the state. And I, I believe that she is still the only nonprofit arts person on that task force. And she is speaking for so many of us and for our field on that task force and directly to the governor's um, office and to the governor himself. And we're grateful that she's with us here today to share what, what she's doing. And again, in all the ways that we might be able to be involved and to support their efforts, we wanna hear from you about what your concerns are, about what your needs are, and about ways that you want to be involved, things that you'd be looking for from our, from our public policymakers at the various levels in ways that you might want to be involved with us in the work of advocating for the arts. So that's sort of our overall shape of this conversation. We'll expect we're gonna go maybe as long as 2.30, but probably at least till 2.15. We've found in these conversations that an hour just was really not enough. We don't wanna rush it but we do want to move a pace as well. So is Narek with us at the moment? He is with us, yay. Yes. Okay, so um, great. I'm so glad you're here. Narek Rome, um, he's vice president um, in charge of government affairs and arts education at Americans for the Arts. And I guess Narek, just to tee it up a little bit, I'd like to you know, ask if you can talk to us a little bit about what's happening sort of right now in Washington and um, ways that we as advocates and folks that want to be weighing in might be able to be involved. Sure, thank you. And, and give me a sense of how, much, how many minutes I should speak for because I don't want to run over. Uh, yeah, I think we've got, we think we like five or six. Okay, uh, well, when these regional conversations began, there were negotiations happening. And uh, now as they wrap up, the, those negotiations between your incredible Bay Area Speaker Pelosi uh, and uh, Senator Schumer from New York and, and the, um, also Kevin McCarthy from Southern California uh, and then uh, Mitch McConnell from Kentucky. Those four, uh, maybe not so much Senator McConnell from Kentucky, but with the White House negotiation team of um, Secretary, Treasury Secretary Mnuchin and uh, the Chief of Staff Mark Meadows, they attempted for about uh, at least a week 
uh, to have daily negotiations at the very top level to try and reconcile a bill that had passed in the House in May called the HEROES Act with a proposed bill by the Senate Republicans called the HEALS Act. Uh, the HEROES Act in May, just to give you a sense of things, was 1,800 pages and a $3 trillion piece of legislation. That is an unheard of kind of piece of legislation that passed the House, but it did pass the House. In the Senate side, it took two and a half more months before a proposal was uh, put forward. It was just a trillion dollars uh, and far more uh, uh, narrow in the kinds of things it was proposing for federal relief in response to, to COVID and as a follow-up to the CARES Act. And so uh, cutting to the chase, the fact is, is that, that the Senate has now recessed and the House is out. Uh, they, uh, even though senators and members have been told they'll be given 24 hours uh, warning if they're asked to come back to Washington uh, for an emergency vote on a COVID-19 package, the fact is there haven't been any negotiations and I don't, no one sees any smooth way for that to actually happen in the next several weeks. Uh, one, because there's next week is the Democratic National Convention, which will be of primary focus for the Democrats, and the following week is the Republican Convention. Uh, and so that's two weeks that right there, that leading into Labor Day. Uh, right now, the House is not scheduled for any votes before September 14th, and the Senate, which might come, could come back uh, quickly, uh, also doesn't have any immediate plans to, to, to do that. So it's rather dismal uh, in that time frame. Uh, at the end of July, as I'm sure everyone has a sense, the unemployment insurance, the federal benefit of $600 ended. The Paycheck Protection Program ended just last week. Uh, and right now, there are, uh, the, there's a number of other CARES Act provisions. Those are the two that had deadlines to them that were of immediate uh, and direct help to the art sector, to the creative economy, to artists as self-employed uh, and independent contractors, and then also arts organizations uh, and, and cultural institutions. And so despite not just all the advocacy that the state arts alliances and agencies may have been doing, uh, and national organizations like Americans for the Arts uh, along with all the other you know, 75 other organizations that signed on to the policy uh, pursuits that we've been uh, after for the last several months, uh, you have more other advocacy organizations and special interests uh, trying to get to a CARES Act, to another uh, uh, relief package, and it is more advocacy than I've been, I, this is my 16th, I just completed my 16th year at Americans for the Arts doing federal affairs work, and this is, there's more um, pressure for Congress to do something than ever before. And of course, they're not able to do it. And it's a, it's a, a, a confluence of political events, a confluence of personalities, as you well know, uh, between leaders and frankly, the complications of some of the policy issues as well. Um, that said, our advocacy continues as does yours uh, and conversations like this that try to identify um, how we are uh, in line and on the same team as so many others trying to continue the unemployment insurance, uh, the federal piece in addition to the state uh, support for the 25 million Americans that continue to be out of work, uh, roughly a million uh, more every week uh, for the last month and a half. And so it's those kinds of pressures that will continue to mount. Uh, and in the art sector, there are uh, even longer term, longer tail concerns that even with not having a bill this summer and try, hoping maybe they'll get to something in September before they then depart again for their campaigns and election uh, in November, uh, there is hope that either in September or again in, in uh, November that there could be um, some type of stopgap approach that would allow for a short-term connection for some of those programs to turn back on uh, and allow um, uh, relief to continue. There's other issues, education funding, state and local government funds, uh, and uh, continued health concerns, uh, health protocols, support for uh, uh, personal protective equipment and so on, and then reopening of schools and how that proceeds in the time to come. 
there's a lot going on there. I'll stop at this point. I'm very happy to talk about any particular legislative priorities within uh, the areas that you guys are working on and I'm very anxious to hear more as well. So thank you for having me. Yeah, great. Thank you so much, Eric. And I think there will be time for Q&A as well at the end. We want a real conversation. So thank you for being here and hopefully to be able to be able to ask, you know, answer some specific questions that people have coming up. I want to um, turn to Julie Baker, the Executive Director of Californians for the Arts and California Arts Advocates, to give us um, sort of a, a view from Sacramento and from what's happening around the state. Julie. Thank you, Brad. Thanks, Rachel. Thanks, Heather, our fearless Bay Area regional leaders for Californians for the Arts and California Arts Advocates. And thanks, Narek, for being here from DC and also right before you go on vacation. So thanks for making the time for us. Um, this is the ninth of our regional conversations. And I love how responsive San Francisco or the Bay Area is region that you guys all respond in the chat. So it's so fascinating to see how all the regions are different. Um, one of the interesting things on, on the federal front, I am the uh, co-captain with Brad to Americans for the Arts and Narek and I pretty much meet weekly, is that in the CARES Act funding, just um, $1.8 billion of PPP loans went to nonprofit arts. Um, so I just, I think it's an important for us to recognize how much, that, and, and the statistic is that it's larger than a decade's worth of NEA funding. And I think that's an important fact in terms of when we talk about what is happening from the federal perspective, or at least did happen, how much was actually given um, in, a, in a way, um, not directly to NEA and that sort of thing, but in through mechanisms like PPP. Of course, there's so much more that is needed and we know that. But let me give you a picture of what's happening at the state level, which is that obviously in the beginning of the year, we were in a very different circumstance for the California Arts Council's budget, which is the state arts agency, which for many years was only at a million dollars. Our organization, both on the um, C3 and the C4 side, which is our lobbying side, have worked really hard to increase that budget. Um, we're now at about $26 million in ongoing funds. It's still not what we need to be. We're still under a dollar per person for the state of California, our small country of 40 million people. But we do, we were poised in the beginning of the year to see as much as $30 million in an increase this year. Of course, when COVID hit, everything else went out the window, and we had to get into a very quick mode of protect the budget. Um, and so we released um, uh, both at the grass tops level in terms of negotiations and meetings with lawmakers, as well as the grassroots level to make sure that that funding was protected and that any relief funds were going to be um, allocated in the state of California or federally, that arts and culture were included in those. Um, happy to announce that in July when the budget was signed, uh, the 26 million was protected in California Arts Council's budget, and they actually have released a million dollars, about $920,000 in individual grants to artists, and uh, Cal uh, Cultural Center for Cultural Innovation is offering those right now. Those are, um, uh, the, the grant process ends on Tuesday, um, and that is directly for arts and culture workers um, who are not receiving UI specifically. Um, I also wanted to mention that um, we started very very quickly also working on a jobs creation strategy for the creative sector. Reading the room in California was and at the state level was understanding that it was going to be difficult for us to get relief funds at the state level because as we understand the state doesn't print money, the feds do, that's where we try to get it from first. And um, so what, and in, in a sense what they also opted to do was give it to cities and counties. So we are seeing CARES Act funding being delivered in cities and counties for um, arts and culture. But um, at the state level, what we started saying is, let's look to the arts and culture sector to actually help during, sorry, during the public health crisis, but in addition, look to us in terms of California's recovery. So when the governor put together that task force, we were not represented on it. Arts and culture was not there. Disney was there, Netflix was there, but not arts and culture. So a collective advocacy movement happened. And uh, we're so pleased that your representative from the Bay Area, Deborah Cullinan, is there. We're, we couldn't be better represented. And she and I are often in conversation around what can be done and, and very much in alignment around this jobs creation strategy, which is kind of a WPA like 21st century, but really more in the idea of arts integration, arts integration, not only to social justice issues, 
issues, but arts integration into the, the areas that the, the state is most focused on, which of course is a public health crisis. How can artists and cultural workers and arts organizations be in service to public health right now? How can you employ us, give us contracts to do that work? And, it, and it's around this message about artists are second responders. Um, and uh, we are not going into a building and saving someone from a burning building, but we are here rebuilding those lives. And, and we created a whole campaign around artists are second responders. You know, one of the things we have to keep an eye on when you're in, in Sacramento is there's a lot of relief, um, I, you know, uh, things put forward. A lot of times they're put forward for small business. And even today, we still have to argue that nonprofits are small businesses. And so, you know, when we had recently Senator Herzberg put forward a $100 billion economic stimulus idea plan. Um, it's just a framework. It was for small businesses and didn't outline nonprofits. So we work in conjunction with Cal nonprofits to make sure that we are part of that language. And we also ask specifically for arts and culture to be recognized. Um, and not only, again, in, in service to public health right now, but also in service service to the recovery and how important that is and how vital we are to our communities and, and um, as trusted community cultural connectors. And um, I think that uh, we have to continue to tell those stories um, and how important that is. And, and your advocacy can be making sure that while we are all at home um, and including your lawmakers are at home, that you are reaching out to them and you are making those relationships. This is your advocacy moment and letting and telling them your story of the impact that you're making. In the nine conversations that we've been doing across the state, the amazing innovation that our sector is doing right now is, in, is just incredible in terms of how we are pivoting, how we are adapting to continue to deliver our services. And I think that that needs to be shared. There's a narrative around the arts are shut down. I think that there's a lot about, of course, the performing arts are shut down and there will be likely until phase four, but there's so much that we can be doing and are doing that needs to not only be recognized Recognized, but also be compensated for. We need to we need to see the investment in our sector. And um, I actually think it's a good segue. And I we work on a lot of legislation as well. Um, there's a lot around AB5 that still continues, and the the follow up legislation to that is AB2257. I'm not going to get into great detail about that, but can ha happily answer questions if that is of, of interest. But I want to um, hand it over to Deborah Cullinan, who of course is the uh, president and CEO um, executive of uh, Yerba Buena Center, um, but who's also doing such tremendous work both at the state and city level in San Francisco. Uh, and so thank you, Deborah, for all the work that you're doing and I hand it to you to, to give your report. Thank you, thank you, Julie, and thank you um, to uh, Californians for the Arts for all of the incredible work that you are doing um, on behalf of all of us. I'm very proud that I was once also a board member. Um, and so uh, it's nice to see some of your faces. You guys are tireless. Um, so uh, as Julie mentioned, I, I have a couple of different um, maybe roles that I'm playing right now that would be of interest to people given that this is a Bay Area focus. So I'll just tick through that really quickly. Um, I am the co-chair of the San Francisco Arts Alliance. Um, we are an alliance of organizations uh, that uh, started a long time ago, well before my arrival. Um, as executive directors of larger organizations, kind of just comparing notes. Um, Brad Erickson and I, uh, together many moons ago, um, founded something called Arts Forum SF, which was in some ways like the small budget version of the Arts Alliance. And Brad and I and others worked very diligently for years to bring those efforts together. Um, which is one of the things that the Arts Alliance is working on right now. Um, the stuff that we've been doing, and it, it, it uh, picks up a little bit on what uh, Narek reported as well, um, we are working very diligently with our lobbyists around federal stimulus on behalf of all of us. Um, just recently um, had meetings with Speaker Pelosi's staff, uh, Senator Harris's staff, and Senator Feinstein. Um, all of them are very versed in what our issues are. All of them are very strong advocates. Um, and, you know, we're really proud of the role that we've been able to play in our own small way to try to move things forward um, in support also of what Americans for the Arts and others are doing. Um, we also have worked very closely with Mayor Garcetti and with Mayor London Breed in order to galvanize mayors across the country. Um, we developed a letter that makes the case for the powerful role of the arts in our local communities. We had 27, 20, I can't remember exact numbers, um, something like 26, 28 uh, mayors signed that letter from across the country. 
uh, and we also, they, they unanimously adopted it at the U.S. Conference of Mayors. It's a big deal because what this does is it gets, it, it makes these mayors our advocates. For each of these phone calls um, that we've had with our local representatives, uh, we brought a mayor or a representative from a mayor's office from some part of the country into the conversation. So really trying to bridge divides, really trying to move the dial um, in terms of uh, building advocacy in our mayoral structure. So that's good stuff. Um, and also with the Arts Alliance and Brad and, and others, I see people here that are part of that. We are working to build on momentum that we gained when we in San Francisco won something called uh, Proposition E at the ballot. Uh, and we're gonna be, um, it, it was like the best proof in our city of what happens when we actually work all together towards something we can get it done. So we're looking at how the Alliance and its structure can evolve to continue to create that kind of energy in the, in the local space of San Francisco, but super interested in thinking about how that connects into the region and also into Californians for the arts and the, state, the statewide efforts. So that's local. Um, I also am on Mayor London Breed's uh, task force. Um, we have done all kinds of things. We had a town hall, um, well, it was maybe not quite a town hall, um, but it was a convening um, that we, we were called to bring together as many people as we could in San Francisco so that the mayor and the leadership of our local task force could hear from our community more broadly. So we, in like five days, put something together. We had about 550 people join. We got lots of information. Um, there's a subcommittee called the Arts uh, Entertainment Hospitality. I can't like all those things, um, subcommittee that's been working really close. So this is bringing here in San Francisco, this is bringing together people who are, you know, it, uh, running the warriors and the giants with the arts leaders, with the restaurant and hospitality industry. And I got to say, it has been one of the most powerful experiences because it's the first time in my endless career when I'm hearing all of these people articulate just how much they need us. Um, so this is a really important thing for us to be thinking about in terms of what we do in, in, turn, in gathering people and building trust and creating space um, for other businesses to thrive. So that's a good thing. Um, and then at the state level, which is probably maybe uh, most interest, um, I am serving on Governor Newsom's Jobs and Business Recovery Task Force. Uh, the task force is you know, really focused on jobs and business recovery, obviously. Um, and is made up of a significant uh, number of leaders in the private sector. Um, you may, if you caught the press conference today, have heard Tom Steyer, who's the co-chair with Anna Leary of the committee, talk about the dig digital divide work that we've been focused on. And part of what I'm trying to do in my lone way is um, just articulate um, the role that the arts play in all of these efforts. So just to be clear with you, the um, the state uh, task force is divided up into subcommittees. The subcommittees are focused on developing proposals. The proposals are meant to, one, help with the implementation of reopening. So testing protocols, PPE, you know, uh, we're, we have a big proposal right now that we're working on around our frontline caregivers, who are the ones that are most hard hit. Um, and so th there's a big focus there on that. The second is job creation, um, job, job pathways. Uh, and the third is ideas literally, literally to restructure society. So this is where equity comes into play, digital, physical, and human infrastructure all come into play. Um, I have pushed forward um, a version of a proposal that was in some ways in response to a, com a little bit of an exchange that I had with the governor in one of the full task force meetings around the role that the arts can play in um, public information and messaging. And the strategy for me is we've got to get the attention of people because that we're not on their minds. Um, and, and that's just a fact that we've all, those of us that have been doing this work for so long, we know this to be true. Um, it isn't that people don't understand the value of the arts, it's just that they, don't, they, they still can't comprehend the depth and breadth of our sector. Um, and we have, only, I think only more recently been able to put really compelling data in front of them. And so one, the exchange was really about the branding campaign that the governor and his team have rolled out across the state, which has to do with mask wearing. And you know, what we all know is that we have to do this. And the single biggest problem that our economy has is the virus. And if we don't address the virus, we can't do anything. Um, 
And so I just, you know, made the case and really drew on, on powerful data from colleagues of ours in other parts of the country, Jill Sankey and her team at the University of Florida School for Art and Medicine, folks at Johns Hopkins and elsewhere, to make the case that it is in, in these kinds of health crises, we know that it is artists that can change behavior. Um, we know it from the Ebola crisis. We know it from HIV AIDS. We have proof. And so I brought that to their attention and suggested that we think about some kind of career pathway program that starts with us um, nimbly deploying artists in service of this kind of public messaging. And then that moves into something that could adopt into more of a social prescribing program where we could unlock you know, billions of dollars if we're smart about it in our healthcare industry, move it from uh, downstream investment to upstream investment because we know that art in people's lives early and often uh, makes for healthier outcomes in the long term. Um, there is a significant interest in this, to my great surprise. Um, and what Julie and I have also talked about is um, the role that some kind of statewide convening could play. Um, and I think that what we have to do as advocates is be strategic. We can't come to the table and just say we need we have to come to the table and say, here's the value we bring. Um, and so I think if we were able to put something together that was very broadly uh, uh, engaged with, if we had lots of participation, we would be able to shine a light on the depth and breadth of our sector. We would be able to highlight how we have been impacted. And we would also be able to, to leverage the, way in, the ways in which we can contribute. Uh, there's also interest in that. What I'm trying to do right now is just kind of understand what we can do quickly. Um, and I'm working directly with folks in Governor Newsom's office. So it's a unique proposal in the context of this weird task force. Um, and I think it'll move maybe more quickly because of that. I think they get it. Um, I did present to the operations committee uh, on Tuesday or Monday or Tuesday of this week. And that's the leadership. They're, they're the decision makers. Um, and I, I was very pleased that the following day, um, when we had our full task force meeting with the governor, Tom Steyer um, brought it up and, and quoted me. And so people are hearing what we have to offer. They also understand how deeply we've been impacted and the connection between our artists, art workers, and in particular youth in the state is, is where we have to focus. The last thing I will say on the subject of youth is, um, this is one of the great, beyond the digital divide, which I think we're, we're now seeing that we're, the, the task force has been able to really address in a lot of ways, um, or at least make some movement on, I should say, uh, that the, this issue of 16 to 24 year olds across this country is really profound. This generation will be so hard hit, and it is not just for now. It is for the rest of their lives. And there is data that tells us that it affects even their life expectancy. Um, and so I say that to you, not to be a downer, but to say we have a lot to offer. We can provide career pathways and creative opportunities for the youth in our state, particularly youth that were already struggling. Um, one of the statistics, if I heard it right, is that 50% of that age group is on unemployment right now. Uh, and there's also no, no clear understanding of how many of them were already were not employed prior to the pandemic. So you can imagine how this affects their job prospects, you know, their life prospects. So I say that to say that that population comes up in every task force conversation. And so it should be important to us to think about that as well. So I hope that wasn't too meandering. Um, and I'm I'm happy to be here. Thank you for having me and for helping Julie and team. Well, we're just so grateful that you were at the table and um, because that's number one is to be at the table. But what I think Deborah is, is so visionary at doing and, and we, we will lend our support in any way that we can. And we certainly exchange ideas and there's a lot of work at this level in particular around not what we can't do, but what 
can we do as a sector right now? And, um, but is, is we can rebuild the table, right? We can make it a, a better table. So I think that's, that's also what Deborah brings to it. So thank you for your vision on that. And I can tell you in other regional conversations that we've been having this concept around artists as messengers, particularly around this behavioral change that has to happen to address our public health crisis is resonating. Um, and um, we were on a call in Inland Empire and there was two supervisors on that. And I kind of floated it saying, for example, you should think about employing artists to actually within your, within local communities to make these messages more, you know, customized versus the government sending out a generic message. And the supervisor is like, that's a good idea. I'm going to bring that back. And I was like, okay, great. So this is where we're, where we're talking about jobs creation, as well as seeing the value of what artists and, and our arts organizations can bring to the table. So there's a lot of great movement towards this and, and Deborah leading the way as well. So thank you. Um, Brad and Rachel, I think what we're going to do now and Heather is that we're going to, we have another little poll, I believe that Jadalis is going to pull up for everyone to uh, fill out. And then really now while you're filling it out, because I know particularly the people in this in this call are very adept at multitasking, um, which is um, I'd also like to invite people to um, let's have a conversation. Um, at this point, you can ask questions of any of the people who've presented um, or bring to the table some of the things that you're either feeling that we haven't looked at or addressed or some of the ways that you're pivoting um, right now or what are the specific concerns that you have that you feel that state and federal government should be also aware of and, and really so that we can be your informed and effective advocates. Um, so uh, if you use the um, hand raise function or in the chat, um, you can also ask to speak at that point. Um, please, please, uh, please join the conversation. And I know this is not a shy group, so. Okay, Jim Schmidt, you go on analog with a hand raise. So you gotta un unmute. There. Can you hear me? Yes. Are you able, are you able to hear me? Okay. Yes. Well, first of all, thanks for putting on this uh, meeting today. Quite a selection of people, and I really appreciate hearing what you are, who are heavily involved in advocates for the arts are doing. Makes me feel good. I represent a small opera company. We're mostly volunteers who run the company with some slight bit of pay, but we hire professional singers and orchestra throughout the Bay Area and actually the whole nation, and we pay the going rate. So our unique situation is we only do two operas a year. It takes about 40 contractors to do an opera between singers and chorus and um, orchestra and stage professionals. When we call these people in, the singers spend the equivalent of about three weeks twice a year, well, for each opera, three weeks in town. The chorus spends maybe two weeks in town on a full-time basis, and the orchestra only one week. For us to make all of these people, 80 people a year employees is, you know, I know there's two sides to the 80, 85 question and I, I feel um, I support people who should be employees. For us, it's kind of existential. It would be such a hit on our budget uh, because since all of our money now goes to pay for an opera, we don't have any extra money and tickets and donations. It's just hard for us to make a quantum leap. So anyway, and, and let me say, and technically, there's a lot to this thing. I think the, apparently the Borrello test can still be used. When I look it over, I think our people satisfy 90% of that, but there's a gotcha here and there. So we need clarity, but we would certainly like the ability to get an answer, first of all. And secondly, we'd like to continue uh, having them as, as, as contractors. They get, to, they get to negotiate their own salary. So they're, um, we do, the best. we do the best. Anyway, that's what I would like is help clarify. Okay. Yeah, so Jim, we've been, uh, California Arts Advocates has been working a lot on AB5 for the last year and a half. We were actually the group that was able to get fine artists into the language for the original bill as an exemption. Uh, there is right now AB2257, which is gone through Senate and is now at appropriations. It is a, a, It requires a two-thirds majority for it to pass. It has an urgency clause in it, which would actually mean that it would pass immediately and go um, and would be retroactive as well. There are a number of um, exemptions in it for musicians in particular, whether or not opera 
singers fits into that. We have to look at the language and I would um, encourage you also to come to a webinar that we're doing with an employment lawyer on August 26, which Jade Alyssa will put in the chat um, that SV creates, Silicon Valley creates is putting on, um, or we can dig a little deeper into specifics around your issue. We also will continue our advocacy to address the fact that we know that this is um, very, it's been really challenging for a lot of small budget arts organizations as much as we all want to see everyone in our sector paid well and paid fairly. We also know that it's it's very challenging when we're so systemically undercapitalized as a sector at the same time. So we need increased resources and we also maybe need increased additional exemptions for particularly small budget arts organizations um, or at least a ramp up period. So we are we do continue to work on that, Jim. So I encourage you to come to the 26th and um, and then you're welcome to also email me um, specifically and we can we can dig into that a little bit further. Thank Julie, you. I was wondering, could we, maybe we could see what the poll results are to see also what the group is feeling about their priorities for our. Yeah, so, yes, I absolutely, I'm sorry. I, I'm trying to uh, see yeah. because it just clicked in front of me. So um, it looks like 74% in terms of the three priority program areas you would like to be provided by us is um, advocacy to get local and state guidelines for reopening of arts organizations. That is very much consistent throughout every conversation we have across every region is an understanding of how can we phase in versus just being part of phase four, which is kind of how we're allocated right. It is how we're allocated right now. Um, some of it is local public health, but a lot of it is, of course, those state guidelines. If you go to covid.ca.gov, there'll be a list of industry guidelines right now. It also is an intersection of working with labor on those guidelines because it's going to um, be their, um, their advocacy as well um, that to make that happen. So um, that is something consistently we're hearing and we are, we are working towards with labor um, at the table as well. How do you, we heard this on another, some other conversations, how do people stay informed about that? It's because people want those guidelines to start planning for performing arts or even visual art galleries, but how do people stay informed or to find out the new news? Yeah, I mean, you know, at the at the state level, it's it's like I said, it's covid.ca.gov is where you're going to basically see if there's anything new coming out. Because I mean, Deborah, I don't know if it's coming up in your task force conversations so much. I, I'm guessing it's not because, you know, because we're we're identified right now. And this is part of the problem. We are identified as part of phase four. They're sort of not having to address it. You saw that museums actually opened and then closed again. Um, and so, uh, we, but we're having conversations around can we do small like recordings inside of theaters to know audiences um, could you have a one or two performers outside um, you know those sorts of things um, we are trying to see how that can be phased in I think just like the AB5 issue you know the art sector is incredibly diverse in the way that we we present our programs and our offerings and so for us to fit into one sort of category is really challenging and that's something that I think we need to educate our lawmakers about about how we can adapt and pivot it doesn't only have to necessarily be on online um, and when we can do it in a safe um, way. And that's going to be, as I said, very important that we work with labor on that. Um, I, and of course, also stay in touch with us and sign up for our e-newsletters. Um, we also have a section on our website under COVID resources, and there's a specific section under reopening. And so there's a lot of information okay. there as well. Yeah, and I would I would just say that I, I think for in San Francisco, the, the reopening conversation is very very vibrant and Brad and others are involved in it. Um, and one of the things that we've talked a lot about um, is that I, I, at least in our case, and I think this is true from conversations I've had in other places, the, the leadership doesn't always know, right? And, and we are experts. Um, and so I, I've seen some very significant progress made because the expertise in the community comes together and puts together the plan and then goes forward to the Department of Health and, you know, and the leadership in the city to, in order to determine what works and what doesn't work. So I do, I do think that people, we should all work together on what a safe reopening can look like and what, what things we can do now in the context of the phases we're in now versus what we want to do moving forward. And Andrew, That's right. And, and Jennifer Bielstein and I from ACT, Jennifer's on the call, I think I saw her earlier, are working to do exactly what um, Deborah was just saying, which is to, we're working with one of the staff members from the Performing Arts Center in San Francisco to 
put together a proposal that we would then present to San Francisco's health department that could be a template for various size venues and then work to get that out to the different theaters and, and concert halls so that they can be working on their own individual plans. I mean, hopefully that's something that could be a, a model for the entire Bay Area region. Um, so just to Deborah's point, we, we might be able to be proactive about this and help our departments of health in understanding exactly what our needs and capacities are and present ideas to them proactively. No, we must do that. That is absolutely what we must do. And we are, uh, that is something that if people want to get engaged with, I'm sure that you guys can, we can certainly, you can engage with us at the state level and, and within your own communities. And I did see a comment that Andrew Wood posted, and then I have some people who have signed up to speak, but Andrew did say for Bay Area based people, we are trying to get performing arts moved up to the reopening pri priorities, blah, blah, blah. Um, going to uh, on Tuesday, send me an email if you'd like to attend. So it's Andrew at um, San Francisco, sfiaf.org. Can I, um, I say for a second? more things about the high, the high points on the poll? People are interested in more information. I'd actually like to offer um, the opportunity for people who've asked to speak, um, okay. to speak, because um, if that, so um, Andrew, I'm going to give you one, uh, one, yeah, go ahead, Andrew, and then I'm going to go to Indy McCasey, who has asked. Okay, the, um, I think the problem in San Francisco is that, um, well, the problem is, is that there's, there's permit officers who are in the entertainment commission or the street departments, and then there's the health department behind them. The health department has to write guidelines before anything can be a permitted use. And they're not doing that at the moment. They're waiting until a use becomes allowable before they start thinking about writing the guidelines. And it's really, it's not a, it's not a health issue, it's a management issue. And that they should be writing those guidelines in anticipation of a use being allowed. So if you wanted to do outdoor performing arts, which is what we're trying to do, the permit officers can't issue a permit because there's no guidelines. So I think it's more of a how do you get back into the system to talk about what they're doing as a management principle and how they're allocating their staff time rather than having it being looked at as a as a as a as a pandemic because it isn't anymore. It's really about management. Sorry, I'll butt out now. Anyway. Thank you for that. Um Indy McCasey, we invite you into the conversation. Hi, everybody. Thanks, Julie. Thanks, everybody, for hosting this. Um, Indy McCasey, uh, Executive Director of the Arts Education Alliance of the Bay Area. And really, my question, because I noticed it wasn't one of the options on the poll results, I'm just really interested in how Californians uh, for the Arts and uh, is uh, if there's any support around hosting uh, because of an election year, any types of community conversations for potential candidates to be able to bring up these issues and really identify uh, candidates running for elected office who um, have this even in the back of their minds, um, all of these you know various issues um, surrounding employment, surrounding uh, the health department. Is there any um, offerings that you all see to support that? Um, well, let me put my California Arts Advocates hat on, uh, because when we're doing that, I can't, I'm not on the C3 side of things. Um, but yes, I mean, we're working with actually the Arts Action Fund um, just released um, a program around um, the arts vote, which you'll see us release next week. Um, I'll be honest with you, Indy, we are a very small organization. Um, it's myself and Jade Alyssa. And um, so from a capacity standpoint for ourselves, it has been a challenge for us to also embrace with all that's been going on with COVID and trying to address all the issues that we're talking about here, um, also kind of focus on the, on the election in, in the state and doing candidate forums. So I, I don't know if we're gonna be able to make that happen at California Arts Advocates. I am certain that, that that's gonna be happening a lot on local levels and we will certainly amplify that and support. Um, but I'm, I don't think we'll be able to, be, to, to do that at this point. Okay, uh, next up, but thank you. And, and we have a section on our website around voting and, and that's where the, the information for the Arts Action Fund will be there as well. Uh, Jean-Marie Durant. Hello, um, thank you so much for um, having this conversation. I just wanted to add on to um, some of the comments around guidelines for um, performances, et cetera. Um, I'm with Oakland Art Murmur um, and something that we're seeing here in Oakland is that um, folks are going ahead and doing it as artists do. 
Um, so we are seeing um, not a lot, but um, some small to mid-size organizations beginning to have outdoor events um, either and promoted, um, maybe not widely, but promoted um, with um, you know, the caveat that there is social distancing and mask wearing required. But I want to just highlight that fact because as we have these conversations, and I know that we're waiting for all the boxes to be checked, folks are getting out there and they're making things happen. Um, so without that, um, the formal guidelines, um, you know, I want to highlight the fact that there needs to also be sort of uh, less maybe policing or maybe some leeway given to organizations so that, you know, should they be out there putting on an event or doing um, a small event that they're not getting fined because these are organizations that probably can't pay the fine anyway. Um, and then I would just say if there are organizations that are doing things that are within guidelines that we kind of get that toolkit. What is, how can we highlight that as a best practice um, and put those into common language? You know, I think you call out the, the COVID um, site. It's very dense. Um, it's hard to read through. I think folks just want to know <laughs> for me, what does this mean for me and my sector? So are there ways that we can segment out that health um, information and put it into kind of digestible, um, easy to understand and updated frequently so that folks can access it in a very quick and easy way? Excellent. Yeah, and we have a lot of models from some other states that have been a little bit more aggressive in reopening. Um, and so our colleagues in those states have worked <laughs> pretty quickly to put together, you know, more easy, the Reader's Digest version of what that looks like. And so um, we have those models. Some of them are on our website under um, COVID-19 resources. Um, and again, we will continue to work on that um, as, as we move forward. Um, I want to invite Lenore Naxon into the conversation. Lenore. Oh, there. Hi, hey there, Julie. I was just, um, I just put in the chat that I just got a copy of the um, uh, Austin, Texas reopening, uh, reopening every, every venue safely guide, which is, um, it's not me just digest, but it's very, <laughs> it's very easy to understand. It's got lots of picture graphs. Um, um, I got this from um, uh, my friend Corey Baker, who runs the Long Center in Austin, and um, I'm, I'm hopeful that we all have these kinds of things that we can share with each other. Um, and, you know, I always say, as I look at these national conversations that California leads the nation, we know this to be true. Often we don't like to say it, but it's really true. Um, when I see it, what, what other uh, performing arts organizations across the country are doing, um, and I'm so thrilled that Deborah is is participating in the govern in the governor's leadership here. And I just don't know if that's happening anywhere else. Does anybody know if it's happening in any other states where there's an arts representative who's sitting at the big table? Narek? Yeah. yeah, this is Narek. Uh, so first off, uh, is there anybody from another state on this call? No, just kidding. Uh, no, California does lead the nation in terms of its policy development. I've worked with California. Uh, not just Julia and her predecessors and Brad, uh, but also with the Hewlett Arts Education Advocacy Cohort, uh, Hewlett Foundation. Uh, I have learned an immense amount about state policy and, and it has impacted federal uh, efforts uh, enormously. Currently, to answer your question, there are some other states that have um, nothing like what uh, Deborah presented, uh, but do have voices in the mix uh, in some of the task forces, but not at the level or the compre uh, comprehension that you, 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 this group is discussing. Yeah, that's what I would answer as well based on my um, meetings with our colleagues across the um, US. So good on us. Um, yeah. Je Jennifer L Lavorne. Thanks, Lenore. Thank you, Julie. Jennifer Lavorne, do you wanna join yeah. the conversation? Yeah, go. sorry. Um, yeah, so I am Jen LaVorne. I'm from the City of Berkeley Civic Arts Program. And um, I feel like there's some low-hanging fruit that's already there um, on the 
uh, State of California Industry Guidance. Um, there's um, under music, film, and television production. Um, the state is saying that they're allowing that, but then they don't provide the actual guidance. I feel like it would be really helpful for them to develop that guidance because our health officer is looking to align with the state as much as possible. So City of Berkeley has their own health officer and then within that, there's the Alameda County health officer. Um, the other thing is that um, live streaming is allowed in San Francisco, but not in Berkeley and we wanna do it, but we're on the watch list. And so, um, you know, that activity can't open up right now, but that feels like a really um, easy low hanging fruit that if the state could allow that, um, I think that would allow the industry um, as a whole statewide to uh, start to do those activities. So right now there are count, you know, it's county by county. Um, but what I've heard from our health officer is that the goal is to eventually align with the state completely. Um, there's also um, various counties which are allowing drive-in entertainment. Um, some of our arts organizations are interested in, you know, somehow going through that route. So maybe that's another thing to look at. Um, and then there's also uh, porch concerts, which are happening uh, everywhere, but our health officer says that those are not allowed um, currently. So um, anyway, I just feel like maybe we could, um, and maybe with uh, Deborah's help, since she's sitting on um, the governor's uh, advisory committee, um, could help just get us to some of those uh, pieces of low hanging fruit. So anyway, that's it. Yeah, it's interesting because um, this, the state task force that I'm on is so focused on jobs and business recovery and they don't see the kind of reopening issues as much as I, you hear about it in terms of um, at least San Francisco's, it's top of mind um, there. So, but, but I definitely, I, I, I can easily just do some digging to see where that is living right now. Um, and see what we can do to make better connection around it. Yeah, and I think to Andrew, Andrew's yeah. earlier point, you know, the, the issues of permits and then who's like what, what the sort of hierarchy of this decision making is, I think are, that that's at least clear to the task force. What's, what's also kind of awesome is that there is an opportunity to change permitting. People, there's a big appetite for that now um, in a way that there wasn't before. So, you know, thinking both in the immediate, what do we need now to be able to do things safely in public space and in our physical buildings, um, but what would we like to be able to do more easily moving forward as well? Yeah, and, and we do know within the administration where this lands, so happy to also, you know, Deborah and I can, this is sort of the summary of the nine conversations where we're going to see the top issues, and then we will make those our priority in terms of policy considerations and what we're proactively working on. Um, and, you know, and, and so obviously, and also including all the work that, Jen, uh, that Deborah is doing. But Jennifer, there is, work, there is a guideline for music recording um, on that website. There is specifically there because AFM actually worked with that, with the governor's office on that. Um, it, is, it is there. I, I, oh, I would I, love to see the link. If anyone could post that into the oh, chat, that would be really yeah. helpful. I'm if looking not, at I'll, industry guidance and I um, haven't found it. So okay, I'll find it for you. Thank you. Um, Seth Eisen, welcome you into the chat. Seth, are you, are you there? If you are, unmute and join us in conversation. Otherwise, I'm going to move on uh, to Lisa Edsel Giglio. Lisa? Hello. Um, thank you so much, all of you. We're just listening for, I'm Director of Education Theater with Silicon Valley, listening for language to share with educators, teachers, um, administrators, parents, everybody who's now in the game about inviting students and feeling safe. So whether that's assemblies next spring or online and virtual and hybrid, just um, looking for that language. If it was out there, we just wanted to make sure we were part of the conversation and promoting that with you as we look to opening in smaller spaces with students versus large organizations. So this health um, officer conversation is very useful and, and thank you for that. But that's what we're, that's what we were looking, listening for in this moment. If that, does that make sense? Just wanting to be united with you. 
Yes, yes, absolutely. And, you know, of course, we're, we're, we work closely with um, Tom DeCaney, um, mm -hmm. who's at the California Alliance for Arts Education and Create California on the, on the guidelines also for and, and sort of making sure that arts ed are, are being um, addressed as well. So, and, yeah. and how arts can really be impactful right now, in particular in education, especially with distance learning. Yeah, and, and appreciating the piece about arts integration as well as the other pieces and, and thinking about that very seriously as a way to support this age group and educators um, in a more explicit way. We all know that's, that's yeah. golden, but it's, it's that explicit moment for, uh, for all of us too. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. No, absolutely right. Um, Anastasia, Anastasia Powers? Sorry. Hi everyone, thank you uh, for having this meeting and um, my, my name is Anastasia Powers. Everybody knows me as Stacy. I'm the executive director of Brava Theater Center and Brava for Women in the Arts in San Francisco. We're very much a part of the Calle 24 Latino Cultural District. Um, we have 10 arts organizations in, a very, in eight blocks. Um, and uh, we're, you know, we're really working on community connectivity and while we talk, we're very much focused on the health of our community, 80% of the cases in San Francisco are Latinos and most of those people live in the southwest, uh, the southwest sector, uh, the southeast sector of San Francisco. So uh, community connectivity is keeping people, you know, uh, out of depression and having this relationship, we're worried about loneliness and that. We're also, so I'm really interested in resources to this partnership between arts and health of a community. Um, we're, you know, we're working with the Mission Food Hub, uh, the UCSF General Hospital has been using our cabaret space as their headquarters to do the mission COVID testing. We're gonna be a polling place um, on election day. Um, and we are creating art in the windows and on the facade to like really make sure our neighbors, because our neighbors are our audience. We have an online audience, but we have the people walking by our building. So we are trying to connect with people to make sure people don't get lost. We're trying to stay connected to our artists so they don't move away. So what are the resources or what could we think about resources as going forward to help us as arts organizations be in that connection with the community because it, as you were saying you know we're second uh, level essential workers but we're all you know we i see us as essential because we are working on the health of our community so i'd love to see more resources available to make those connections happen it's absolutely and um one of the things that i think that um I mean, I don't know if I have an exact answer for you in terms of is there a resource uh, network for that, but um, I think it is part of what we all need to do in terms of shifting not only our own narratives around what is what it is that we offer within our own communities. Um, I mean, we've we've led with a creative economy messaging and an economic impact message for so long, which is important. I mean, there's no doubt, and, and Deborah will attest that that's going to be really critical in terms of jobs and what people are thinking about. But I think that that social impact what you're talking about and how we are those connectors within our communities and the vital services that we're continuing to provide is is so critical that we get that out there in terms of our uh, messaging to the people who can actually allocate resources. Um, I do think we also need to look at ourselves in other sectors and so looking there is a website that Cal nonprofits actually lobby to put together um, that is a portal for accessing every grant opportunity at the state, or I'm sorry, contract opportunity at the state level. So in other words, where you can see, you can be typing in culture, the word culture or arts and find yourself in the mental health uh, state agency and how do you and maybe addressing some issues there and applying for a large contract so we, we need to also look beyond like let's say the state arts agency as the only mechanism for where we can see ourselves for opportunities for for also for resources so um so uh, i think jade Alyssa can put that in the chat where you can see that portal great um, awesome. so. thank you uh okay uh up next is um joni mcbrien 
Hi there. Uh, my name is Joni McBrien. I'm the director of development for Shotgun Players Theater in Berkeley. And I was actually very inspired by uh, some of Deborah's comments about the idea that arts and artists can be leaders in terms of helping with messaging for our current health crisis. And so I just want to say, where do we sign up? I have so many artists that are eager for work. And the thing is, we're also like so many other performing arts organizations, we've you know, tried to do creative things with the Zoom platform. We're offering artists work in a wide range of you know, online capacities. And the truth is we're just, we're gonna be in this reality for a while. And we had a contest for artists a couple of months ago that was called uh, Two Minutes in Two Days, where artists were given a short list of criteria to create a video about anything. But one of the criteria was that it had to include a mask. And so we've, you know, and people come up with very creative things. So if, especially if, there, if this is also a way where we're able to tap into different funding and then, you know, whether it's a list of criteria that artists are given to create something, I just want to say uh, we're ready. I have 50 artists off the top of my head that I could think of that would be eager to participate. So any further information on that particular project, we'd be very, very eager to have our artists participate. Um, that's that's great, Joni. I you know I, I think that this kind of dovetails also with what Stacy's talking about, which is part of the reason to try to lay out a proposal um, that is partly about what we can do right now to help with messaging um, and to help in very hard hit communities. Um, and the way in which we do it as 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 artists and arts organizations is 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 you know with an equity lens really focused on the the local context you know the things that a billboard campaign can't do, um, uh, and then and then connecting that into what it would look like if we could have a social prescribing program where just like doctors can write you a prescription to go to the gym if you have um, a particular health issue. Uh, we want doctors and, and healthcare organizations to be able to prescribe the arts. Um, and that could be everything from art hours, and there are lots of experiments and examples of this here in this country and in other parts of the world, you know, just going to see an exhibition or spending time in the theater, or it could be literally art hours. It could be artists who are working very specifically with people who are experiencing social isolation or are, you know, managing particular anxiety or mental health issues. Um, and I think to Julie's point, this is one example of looking at what we can do and then the sectors that would most benefit from that um, and creating sort of experiments that prove the concept in order to unleash some dollars to support what's already being done. I mean, part of the reason for the idea of some kind of statewide convening is because we all know this is happening all over the state. The artists, arts are the, the hardest hit sector and yet, the artists are showing up doing public messaging. And so if we do that without, you know, entirely underfunded, and we do that in a way that is not necessarily connected, um, what could we do if we got it funded and we lifted it into a little bit of a system so we can share resources and ideas? So that's very much the work that YBCA is doing, is really thinking about how do you build the capacity of artists to be in service and then also connect them to the right demand. Um, so this is one effort that just, the, the, the reason I went with the particular health piece for the governor, um, as opposed to some of the other really great ideas, Julie, that we've talked about that are broader, is because that was what was most pressing for him and for his team at the, in the moment. But it doesn't mean, you know, right. now there are five or six core C-O-R-P-S proposals. Um, and I think the leadership at the state level is interested in what is one core that puts all of these things together. And that would be a real win for us because it would mean that artists could be deployed in all of these different kinds of ways. So I'm definitely, I mean, I, you know, the only way that I could do, move anything forward is with all of you. I mean, there's no other way to, it'll work. So <laughs> stay tuned. And, and I, I would also add, Joni, that I think that, you know, there are, there is funding at your city and, and your, you know, your local levels. Some of it is specifically for public health. Um, and it, and I think that there is an opportunity even now to present yourselves and say, you know, we can, we, we're here to help. 
We're not here to ask for a handout. We're here to help. Um, look to us as part of the sector. Now, we're not doing it for free because we don't ever want to put out there that we work for free because that is not helping our sector. <laughs> but that um, I do think that you can start to show up locally as well and look for those avenues already while we're still continuing to work at the state level, which can work a little bit slower at times. So, um, so I would recommend that. Um, uh, Patricia Zamora or Pat. Pat. Hello. I hope that I don't get cut out. Um, so I wanted to just focus real quick. Thank you, first of all, um, for everyone who reported out. It's just these meetings are like lifelines uh, with everything that's happening. Um, I wanted to just get focus real feedback on the art artists as public messengers um, and also um, thinking about um, how we define audience pre-COVID and post-COVID. Because literally when I walk down the street, that is my, your audience can be as big as the sidewalks, the walls, the parks. I mean, and it sounds very high, high in the sky, but um, I'm thinking of this project recently. I live in San Francisco and also I'm living in the Central Valley right now because of the pandemic. So I've been part of this breakout and then also the Central Valley. So it's very interesting to hear intimately how different parts of the state are impacted but one thing that we did was that i did was real simple was just there's a group called artists against the infodemic which is to cat um catch light stanford um disturb there was another group based out of um i think it's out of south africa but they launched these um murals that were a story a photograph and a piece of art and they're huge murals and so I was able to get park and rec in the city in Livingston to put it up in a park where a lot of people walk. And then I also connected them with Boys and Girls Clubs of San Francisco, and they're putting those murals up, I think right now in Bayview Hunters Point, it's three communities that are disproportionately affected in, in San Francisco. So this isn't anything new because all, all of you do this, we all do this already in terms of being connective tissue. But I think that one of the things is how can we be mutually reinforcing of each other's efforts? So I didn't have to go out and find this, this, this event. It was more just like being at the right place in the right time. And we have these different connective tissues. How do we help each other amplify the message? And right now, you know, being in the Central Valley, like I was said it in the other breakout group where, you know, you're with the people who are bringing food into the Bay Area you know, the farm workers, the factory workers, the chicken plant workers, all those people that are feeding us here in the Bay Area are right here in the Central Valley. And so there's these really important, and then, you know, like I think one of my other uh, fellow members here was talking about the mission, you know, the disproportionate number of Latinos that are impacted, um, not only, you know, all over. So, um, just this thing of the messaging, how can we mutually reinforce, not reinvent the wheel, not do it for free either, um, but also think about our audiences. And I think, you know, the work that um, YBCA, you know, some of the work with bringing in community groups into the, the space of that center, um, just really, really thinking about our own connections very differently and kind of outside of outside of the walls, you know, and because if, if we're really going to reach out, I mean, people, it's hard to talk about art when people are really afraid and they're scared and they're locked down and we know that. And so like, if they're walking to the store and there's a way to be a mural or something on the sidewalk or something, whatever it might be, uh, and it can be simple ways but they need to be funded and sustained and, and maybe, you know, just thinking about it differently. So anyway, thank you for hosting us, Julie. And um, this is, this is really important. Yeah. It's nice to see you again, Pat. We're going to, we're going to, um, she was in our central Valley conversation and she's right. They're really different all over the state. So it's been a really wonderful education for us as your state advocacy organization also to hear from all the different regions across California. And I, I think that again, finding the common threads, finding what's unique to regions, where we, what we need to really prioritize and focus on as your advocacy organization, 
a small capacity organization as well, and needing all of you to, you know, continue to do the work that you're doing. Um, and we are so grateful and so inspired by everything that, you know, the arts continue to offer in so many communities um, throughout California. I think Jadalis is going to um, put out a, a third poll question, uh, and that will help us to sort of wrap this up because we're, we're into about 75 minutes now. I appreciate everyone who's shown up here today. And um, I, I can't believe we're finishing our ninth regional conversation. This is so great. And I, and I think that, you know, what we want to make sure is that we are hearing from you, that we are listening to you, that we are addressing some of the main things that, you, you know, are, are going through what you're, the work that you're doing and, and, and um, how we can support you best. Um, and so definitely, if you're not on our mailing list, please sign up for our mailing list, you know, here so we can be in constant contact um, and, um, and continue to do the work that we need to do to, you know, not only rebuild California, but as, as I'd like to say, rebuild the table um, that we're going to be at because we're going to show up in force. And that's, that's kind of the message I think that we as Californians for the arts just want to make sure that people realize is that right now your advocacy is really important. Every part of every sector is suffering right now. And, uh, you know, we all, we need to raise our voices in support of our sector in arts and culture and, and making sure that we are not only being addressed, but that we're also showing how innovative and creative and solution oriented we are and always have been. Um, but this is an opportunity really for us at this moment in time that is, I think, hopeful in many ways. And I also think that there is really opportunities for cross sector. And I think Deborah will agree with me that we also know that government cannot do it all. And so the public private partnerships are going to be as critical as ever before. And so looking for those opportunities within your own communities, whether it's cross sector within, as Pat was talking about, or, or within other industries and sector industries to also look for that as well. And I want to say before we go, first of all, thank you to Julie and to Deborah and to Narek and for um, all the speakers today and to all of you for being here and participating in this. Um, I know that Rachel and Heather and I, um, with the rest of the Board of Californians for the Arts, are really interested in the possibility of continuing this kind of regional meeting and what the potential for that might be. And so we've asked you that question. We want to hear from you one more time in the chat if you have a moment before you go about what you found to be most helpful about today. I might also encourage you to add, if you'd like to, what, you know, what a future convening might be able to address. Um, so many of you are really active in your, in your own communities and in your own cities, and we are asking ourselves as to whether there's a way that we can amplify and, and support each other better um, as, a regional, as a regional kind of group in regional gatherings like today. So hearing from you will help us really understand the potential for that. So thank you for that. Thank you for everyone for being here today. And we look forward to, and Julia has one more thing to say. Just to say that we do a, a post. <laughs> Every person who signed up for this will get an email. And also there's a survey questions in that, which will also off, offer the opportunity. So if you don't get a chance to put it in the chat right now, you'll also have an opportunity in a, in a post um, survey. So great. Thank you for that. Thanks. And thank you to Jay Delicia for all of her amazing support. Yay. Anyway. Bye. All right, I think we're done. Thanks everybody. Great to see you and stay safe and stay well.